Hey guys, here's the second part of the November compilation. I'm going to say a quick thanks to my patrons. Jill Hutchins, Elena Renee, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire05, Linda, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Lavalaise, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. Now enjoy the video, guys. My wife and I travel often, city to city, and at one point we settled in Vegas for a few months. There was one night we were arguing after work, headed towards Henderson. I was sitting reclined back in the passenger seat when we ran over something and the tire definitely popped. My wife got out to check and confirmed it. Within seconds, a woman in a very nice car pulls up behind us. I saw she was a woman and I laid back in the seat, still mad, still stubborn, and figuring she was just checking on my wife, assuming she was alone. The woman said she had a brother-in-law with a tow truck. He could definitely tow the car free of charge to a shop. My wife asked why she was being so kind, and she said something like, Our sisters gotta stick together. I'm helping you out. She then got back in the car, and my wife told me she was going to follow us with her hazards on to this empty and dark parking lot in front of some grocery store nearby to get us out of the road. I still didn't think this was weird at all. My wife was very confident that this woman was genuine and really wanted to help. So we pull into the parking lot and my wife got out. I'm still laying back. This woman doesn't even know I'm here yet. She started talking to my wife about how she changed her life within a year. She could put her on to what she does. It seems believable. She looked very nice and her car was definitely expensive. My wife keeps insisting she just call a tow truck. She felt bad she was taking time from her. We could afford it. The woman kept insisting her brother-in-law was coming. Be patient. He really doesn't mind. She even offered at some point to drive my wife around the area to look for a shop that was open, but my wife had already googled some places. She told her that's smart, and they kept talking. No suspicion, honestly. She then starts asking my wife why she's in Vegas. She says for adventure and doing something new, blah blah blah. The woman asks if she has family she's close to or a boyfriend. She could introduce her to some of her friends to get her well acquainted or whatever. She motions over to me and says, Well, I have a husband, and the woman looked like a deer in the headlights. I waved politely. She leans over and finally sees me, stares for a few seconds, and immediately gets into her car. Instantly, I've never seen someone look at me like that. Like she had to get away from me. She tells my wife she has to go to a store that's opening soon. Her brother-in-law is taking too long, but he will be there in an hour at least. She told her not to leave. He will come help. Just one hour. My wife was confused and tried to ask if she'd be there too, but the woman just drove off. We knew that there was something wrong with that situation. We both just stared at each other in confusion. I have no idea still of why that happened. We called a towing company and fixed the car within 40 minutes. Drove back to wait because my wife was persistent in believing that the woman was going to come back, or her brother-in-law would, and she wanted to let them know that she didn't need their help. I told her I don't think they're coming back, but we did wait. No one came for two hours before we just drove home. I did some research and found out a lot of traffickers use women because they seem more trustworthy. Vegas obviously has a large presence of these things as well. The woman was almost desperate to keep my wife there. It was all so weird. Now, when I look back, it seems more obvious that there was a danger. But in the moment, the woman was so charming and endearing that it seemed like she was genuinely trying to help. I still don't know, 
but I'm pretty sure she ran off because I was there, and she didn't anticipate a man to be there. For a bit of background information, I am a 21-year-old female, and the city I currently live in, as well as my hometown, are two of the major cities in which women are trafficked. Because of this, I have to drive between them to get either place, and the interstate I take is one of the most trafficked interstates in the whole US. That means many vehicles that take this interstate are taking trafficked people to and from places. I have never been afraid of being on my own. I drive alone to and from my hometown to where I live now. I was directly in the middle of my drive home when I had either hit something or a tire popped. My car broke down, so I pulled over to the side of the road and immediately called my dad and then roadside assistance. Both parties told me they would arrive in about 30 to 45 minutes. So I was just sitting there with my doors locked, looking at my phone. About 25 minutes of sitting there on my own, I see an unmarked car pulling up behind me. I have been towed before, and I know some tow trucks don't have their advertisement on the side of their trucks. So I assumed it was the tow truck and he arrived there early. A man hopped out of the truck and came to my passenger side window. He looked in to see if there was anyone in there because I have dark tinted windows. He saw me and unfurled the most creepy, disgusting smile I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it made me absolutely nauseated. He then started knocking on the window, and this is the conversation that followed. Roll down the window, sweetie. Can you identify yourself? I don't know who you are. Come on. I'm just trying to help. Roll down the window so I can talk to you. I just want to help you. My dad is almost here. He can help me. Thank you, though. He started getting angry at this point because I think he realized whatever he wanted to do had to be quick. Roll down the window now, or I'm going to break it open. I'm calling 911 right now. Get away from my window. The man then walked back to his car and immediately got on his phone. Right then, a sheriff nearing the town that was clocking speed pulled over in front of me. He came up to my driver's window and asked what had happened to my car and if I needed help. I told him what happened and said I didn't need help, but it would be appreciated if he could sit down with me and wait for my dad or tow truck. Thank goodness he did. The man behind me saw the police talking to me and continuing to stand with me, so we drove off. I got my car towed and went home. I don't know what would have happened if the police didn't show up when they did. It could have been a person just trying to help, but my gut told me otherwise. This story took place years ago. I was driving to my grandma's house, which is about an hour from my work. It's a pretty straight shot up to the interstate, and while I usually took the back roads, it was getting kind of rainy, and I just wanted to go ahead and get there and get home. My car at the time was a beater station wagon that had a tendency to sort of overheat, but not really. It would just kind of stop working. This was usually when the gas tank was getting on the low side, but it wouldn't actually be out of gas. Usually, if I let it sit for a few minutes, it'd be fine. Anyhow, I'm heading to my grandma's when the car starts overheating. I pulled over to the shoulder and cut the car off. I wait about five minutes, just sitting there smoking a cigarette. I go to start it up, and nothing. It wouldn't actually turn over. As the daughter of a well-versed car guy, I popped the hood. Not that I would actually be able to recognize exactly what was wrong, but I knew enough to at least rule some things out. I didn't notice anything major malfunctioning, 
So I start to make my game plan. At this point, I'm still about 40 minutes away from my destination. My dad is a good hour and a half from me, so I decide to call the roadside assistance number in my state. The dispatcher is very nice, lets me know that a tech should be there in 30 minutes. So I start to settle in my car to wait while the rain sprinkles outside. After about 15 minutes or so, a car pulls up in front of me. It is not the roadside assistance guy. It's a stranger in a beat-up 80s Monte Carlo. He starts to walk to my car. Just so you know, I live in the south. It's not out of character for someone to stop and help you. Anyhow, I watch as the man approaches. He's tall, about six foot three or so, and built like he might work in manual labor. I roll the window down about three inches, because it's raining and I don't know this person. He gets close to the window and asks if I need help. I thank him immediately, but let him know that no, I'm all good. I'm waiting for the roadside assistance guy to come and show up. He says, I work on cars, want me to take a look and see if there's a loose wire or something. I thought it was a nice offer because I'm a little too trusting, and I say sure. I pop the hood again and get out of the car to look with them. I know, stupid decision, but again. I'm pretty trusting. He fumbles around a little with various wires that are perfectly fine, making small talk about how he was coming from a local army base from visiting his daughter and heading back to his home that's in the neighboring state. I found it a little odd. I mean, it could have been legit, but he was wearing really dusty, dirty clothes, jeans with huge holes in the knees, and he just didn't look clean. Not that you would go to the base in your Sunday clothes, but chances are you would have been showered. So then he starts saying, Well, it doesn't look like your roadside assistance is coming. He said it almost accusingly, as if I had never called them, and made that part up when he first got to my car. Still being doe-eyed, I said, Actually, he should be here any minute. That's when it got weird and my spidey sense finally started tingling. The rain is getting a little heavier by the minute. He looks at me, mostly at my chest, and his energy changes. He offers to take me to the McDonald's off the next exit for a cup of coffee and to get out of the rain. I thanked him for the offer, but said no thanks. He said, it's right up there. We'd be able to see the roadside assistance guy. I thanked him again and declined, saying I'd be fine in my car, no biggie. He started to get more and more aggressive in his offer, saying things like, come on, it's just right there, one cup, my treat. My daughter's a soldier, I wouldn't try anything weird on you, just hop in the car and we'll go right there. Each time he says something, he moves a little closer to me. The little voice in your head that goes off kept saying, Keep acting dumb. Keep being polite. Keep refusing. Get in your car and lock the door. Finally, when I told him that I really appreciated his offer, but since I didn't know him from Adam, I just wasn't comfortable enough doing that. But how incredibly kind it was for him to stop and be so helpful, and that I really hoped he had a great day. He finally relented. I had been edging my way to my door as the rain hit its crescendo. Once in the safety of my car, I locked all the doors and watched him walk back to his car and then drive away. Not five minutes later, the roadside assistance guy arrives. He comes up to my passenger side window as the rain has pretty much returned to a light drizzle. I get out and tell him the story of the man and what transpired. He gets his horrified look on his face and says, You do realize you would never have been heard from again if you'd gotten into that car. I explain that the guy kept being pushy about it, and the alarm bells finally sounded, and all I could think to do was continue to be polite but firm, so that he didn't get angry or offended, and finally snap and do God knows what. 
He told me I should never have gotten out of the car, and I should thank my guardian angel that I'm okay. I'm pretty certain I was a frog's hair from being found in the garbage bag. This happened a few years ago, but has impacted me greatly since then. I was in college, living on campus in a dorm house. My college was small, and the dorm house was an actual house that had been converted for dorm rooms. My vehicle broke down and had to be towed from my dorm's parking lot to a dealership 20 miles away. I call a local tow truck company, who sends a truck out and I decide to ride with the driver so that I can talk to the dealership service team about getting a rental. The whole drive down, the guy is talking about whatever hits his mind. I'm trying to be nice because it's a good 20 to 30 minute drive down, and I might as well have a conversation. Along the drive down and the drive back, with no luck for a rental, he turns from random conversation to specifically talking about his ex and how she did him wrong. I am stuck in this truck with him, so I minimally respond and deflect when I can. He's got the upper hand because I've stupidly decided that riding with him was a good idea. When we finally get back to my dorm, I make it inside safely. I figure that's the end of it because I'm not planning on needing a tow anytime soon. But then I start getting texts and calls from an unknown number. Turns out, he copied my information off the tow request form the company fills out when I called for a tow truck. I get majorly freaked out because I didn't give any information to the company just so their driver could harass me. I also have to deal with random drive-bys by the driver, and he stopped by once to see if I'm home. After a week of messages and calls, I called the owner to talk to him about it, and he does the old. Well, maybe he just thought you were nice and you shouldn't be so stingy with him. I basically had to tell him I would be filing a restraining order or something equivalent for him to take it seriously. I still think about this every time I'm asked to give contact information for a home service job or see an unknown caller on my phone. I've never ridden in another tow truck since. Back in the summer of 2015, my friend Kate and I were coming home from a trip with her parents to a resort town in the mountains for a couple of days, which was famous for skiing. The highway to get you there wasn't too bad, as it had some significant upgrades for a big athletic contest that our city had hosted a couple of years prior. However, it still cuts through some relatively remote terrain, and it's not uncommon to see deer and bear on the side. Her parents wanted to go hike up to a lake near the highway, which was between the town and the larger city where we lived for a swim. So we pull off the road and park in a small parking lot. This was not an official swimming lake, and a logging company used the parking lot. So although we were allowed to be there, there was no one else in the lot, and it is not well known. So we all pile out of the car, and start figuring out what we needed to throw into our backpacks for the hike and swim, as we had not planned for this when we'd left our rental. Out of the corner of our eyes, we notice a man walking out of the woods on a small dirt road that's snaking away from the logging camp and our intended hiking area. He comes up to the car and starts to explain that he'd been up the road, cleaning up a campsite that he and his friends had been staying at, and even though where they were camping was illegal, he wanted to come back after and make sure it's clean. Unfortunately, after cleaning up, his battery had died, and he asked if we could drive him up the road to the campsite and jumpstart his car for him. He said he doesn't want to wait for roadside assistance, as we were in a pretty deserted area of the highway, and he doesn't want to get into trouble for camping illegally. There was something extremely odd about him and his mannerisms to me. However, I can't explain why, but from being a reasonably attractive female in my mid-twenties and dealing with creepy guys often enough, all of my instincts were yelling at me not to follow this man into the woods. 
I remember that he was oddly specific about the make and model of his car that had broken down, repeating it multiple times, and it was only a minute or two drive down the dirt road. Kate's parents are amicable and agree right away to give him a jump. Without waiting, he states that he will meet us at the car and points down the road saying it's only a two to three minute walk down the road. However, being raised on cold case files and Law & Order SVU marathons, I did not want to go to that car or go into the woods. Not wanting to make a scene, I suggest that Kate and I walk over to the small bridge we had crossed to enter the parking lot and take some photos. So she and I walk over there and I start freaking out, telling her that something felt off and I didn't like what was going on. I began texting another friend, telling him where we were, and if I stopped texting him, he should call the police and tell them what was happening. Cell phone service in that area was super spotty. I was just praying he would be getting my messages, because all the hair on the back of my neck was standing on end at this point. Meanwhile, her parents had gotten back into their vehicle, and drove down the dirt road to find the car. About five minutes later, we hear their car honking. They had gone down the dirt road slowly, and they haven't seen the man, the car, or the campsite. There was no trace of anyone. We see her parents come back up the dirt road, and then drive down another, honking again. Her parents went up and down a couple small dirt roads, for maybe another five minutes all just trying to find this man and his dead car, but they couldn't find him, and he never responded to their honks. At this point, Kate and I are getting very agitated by the strange circumstances, and we just want our parents to come back. When they do, I flat out state that I am highly uncomfortable with what just happened, and I didn't want to continue with our planned hike into the woods. They were spooked too, and agreed to get out of the area. We ended up stopping a while further down the highway at a much more popular provincial park lake. I have no idea what was going on that day. What would have happened if Kate and I had gotten into the car to go with her parents? But I felt seriously lucky that we did not find out. So this was two to three years ago in India, and my father and I were driving home from a wedding. I don't know how much you all know about weddings over there, but this was a three-day event that involved the entirety of two middle-of-nowhere nothing villages. It was a huge deal, and we were the only white people the majority of these folks had ever seen. So beyond the bride and groom themselves, we were the best guests. This meant near constant attention, no relaxation or any time to ourselves, and sleep came in the form of a concrete slab of a bed with a thin blanket over it, nestled snuggly in between apparently every drunk uncle the village could hold, all passionately arguing for hours about something in Hindi. I think it was maybe the music, which also constantly blared from concert-sized speakers through the whole village. It was safe to say by the time we left the wedding, we were already extremely sleep deprived and out of it. This isn't even the fun part though. Through an odd chain of events that aren't totally related to this story, while driving home on a single lane road that had traffic in both directions, dodging donkey carts, groups of scooters, and other drivers about 120 kilometers an hour, we get in a head on collision. I remember realizing what was happening a few seconds before it did. Closing my eyes, loosening my body, making sure my tongue would be okay. And then bam, the world turned upside down. And then again, and again, and then one more time. Our car flipped four times, landing upside down in an overgrown field near the spot of the accident. The other car was mostly gone, and what was left of it was still on the road. Glass everywhere. My dad was unconscious. 
My languor was ripped to shreds, and there were suddenly voices all around me. I remember being extremely confused and dazed, and I hurt. Why did I hurt? Dozens of people had apparently stopped to flip the car back over to help the American tourists out. A few people pulled me out through the left-hand broken window and immediately went back in to help my father on the driver's side. I, extremely confused, exhausted, and scared, most likely concussed, wandered over to the road and the other demolished car. I could hear a siren in the distance. An ambulance. Cops. I didn't pay attention. Where were my shoes? Suddenly, a man had his arms around my shoulders and was ushering me to an unknown white car a small distance from the wreck. I will take you to the hospital, he said. I asked where my father was and a few other questions. He mostly ignored me. He is fine, come on. He pushed me forward and in a daze I followed, asking about my things, my shoes, my dad. All I had was my phone, which was still in a death grip in my hand. He ignored me. Do not worry. Hurry. Get in the car. I did as I was told, though I remember asking a few more times about my shoes. I was barefoot and limping. I remember being focused on my right foot, how it wouldn't work basically ignoring the guy guiding me away from the accident and the rest of the people. Why did it hurt so much? And where was my bag? The man urged me forward some more, making promises that my things were fine. He had them already. Just get in the car. I was barely paying attention, slowly following. Where was my dad? At that point... I guess the man decided I wasn't moving fast enough. He wrenched my phone from my hand, maneuvered me into the back seat, and slammed the door behind me. He was walking around to the driver's side when an ambulance pulled up. I struggled with the door, saying I'll get into the ambulance instead, that my dad must be there, and where were my things? No, he slammed the door again, locking it this time. Be quiet. At this point I started to cry, and was still confusedly trying to open the locked door, blubbering that I needed my things. He insisted he was helping and to shut up, shut up, and shut up. He rushed around, opened the driver's side door, and was about to get in, when I heard an almost roar-like sound erupt to my left. Suddenly, my father was there, Bleeding, limping, ignoring the chaos all around us, and angrier than I've ever seen him. Get my daughter out of your fucking car. He grabbed the man, who was halfway in the vehicle, and threw him to the ground. He unlocked the backseat door, and rushed around to pull me out. Dad, where are my shoes? Does he still have my phone? I obviously asked to thin air, as my father was already back a few feet away, shouting, hands around the man's throat, demanding my phone. With a terrified look, the man pulled it out of his pocket and threw it several feet away, causing my dad to drop him on the pavement in one swift motion and bound after the device. At that point, the man hurriedly climbed into his car and sped away while I made my way back into the waiting ambulance still not really processing what had just happened. My dad materialized on the bench next to me a few seconds later, my cracked phone in hand, and enveloped me in a huge hug while saying how scared he was. The paramedics moving all around us, securing everything, and preparing for the drive to the hospital. Everything after that is a story for another time. This happened to me years ago on a Memorial Day weekend. After a solid weekend of partying in Las Vegas, two of my friends and I 
all guys the same age, had to endure the horrific drive from Las Vegas to LA. If you haven't done this drive before, it's typically a five hour stint through the desert. But on a busy weekend, it can be extended to seven to nine hours. And hungover from a three day binge, it's always painful. Our other friends that were flying out, talked us into staying for the better part of the day to wait out traffic. We had a buffet and laced around the pool a bit, hoping to recover. We decided to leave at 3 p.m. Perfect. We will be home by 8, we thought. Wrong. Two accidents and a billion people on the road impeded our progress greatly. It took us six hours to get to Barstow, which was about two hours away. We filled up, gas and coffee, and then hit the road again. The stop took an hour due to the mass amount of people passing through the area. Back on the road at 10, more traffic and a wrong turn. It is now 2.30 in the morning, and we're passing through Santa Clarita, about 45 minutes from our destination. And then bam, a sound that sounded like a piece of steel ripping like paper and then exploding. I managed to pull the car off the freeway and onto the side street. I called AAA and they said it should be about 30 minutes. Shitty situation, but 30 minutes is not that bad. The neighborhood we were in was alright. Multiple gated communities, but the road we were on was desolate and a bit of an artery between the communities. We all napped and about 15 minutes later, I was awoken by a car driving by in the opposite direction. It was a piece of shit SUV, with about four people inside. I couldn't tell what they looked like, but they were all looking at us. A few minutes after that, I get a call from AAA. Apparently when I called, they thought that I said Santa Clara, which is six hours north in the San Francisco area. It would be another hour before they could reroute someone to us. We go back to sleep. And roughly 30 minutes later, that same SUV drives by on our side of the road, going much faster this time. And as they pass, they flash a light into my car. I'm not sure if it was to scare us or to see if there were people inside, but my red flags went up. For safety reasons, I always kept a bowie knife and a miniature bat under my seat. So I took the knife and passed my buddy in the passenger seat the bat. He was asleep and didn't understand what was going on. So I briefed him, but he passed it off and was out again. Fifteen-ish minutes later, the SUV pulls up about 300 feet behind my car. Brights on, and I officially begin to freak out. I wake up my two friends without them moving their heads, so that Team Creeper can't see. We begin forming strategies, but we are genuinely scared since we are stranded and outnumbered. The SUV turns off the lights, and I can see them passionately talking about something. So we sit there, freaking out, and just watching them, waiting and swapping ideas of their intent. I decide to call AAA again, and they now give me an ETA at 15 minutes. Home stretch. The passenger and driver's doors both open and two linebacker-sized men get out, hoods up and dressed in all black. The driver leans against the grill of the car and smokes a cigarette, staring at us. The passenger pisses on the sidewalk. It felt like they were playing mind games. Maybe they saw the light from my cell phone. It felt like the passenger was pissing forever. The three of us are just sitting there, stewing in our own fear. The passenger then zips up and talks with the driver. The other two doors open, revealing one small person with a beanie pulled low and another large hooded man. The four begin to talk and walk casually towards my car. I pull my knife ready, my buddy has his bat, and my other friend pops his fist like a fighting Irishman. They get close, then stop about halfway. In the distance were the lights of the tow truck. I look back and see them get in the SUV. As the tow operator gets out, we get out, and he starts his business. 
The SUV speeds off fairly quickly. We didn't get home until 5 a.m. I am not entirely sure what they were planning. I'm assuming they thought the car was abandoned and wanted to take it. Or maybe something more sinister if they knew we were in there. My friend who is in the back seat has long hair, so maybe they thought he was a woman. I'll never know, but it was an intense night. Moral of the story, never leave Vegas late if you're driving. I have been dating my girlfriend for a few years. She's a small blonde with a positive attitude about everything. We both go to college, so we only get to see each other so much. Her college is in New Hampshire, and mine is in Massachusetts. Since she doesn't have a car, I will drive up to her in my old little red car that I got from my grandmother. I'm not a huge fan of the car, but I basically got it free, so I can't complain. I've never had an issue making this hour and a half drive, but a few weeks ago, I got more than my fill. I was visiting my girlfriend, and it already was becoming a rough day. We wanted the dorm room to ourselves, but her roommate wouldn't leave, so we hung out in the common room. After spending most of the day together, we finally called it time for me to head back to my own college. I said goodbye and that I would text her when I got back. It was 6 o'clock anyways, and it was getting pretty dark outside, given that it was winter. I normally take the New Hampshire back roads for a more scenic route, and also to avoid traffic. It doesn't affect the time of traveling at all, so I guess that's a plus. Most people who live in or visit New Hampshire know that most of the back roads are not lit well with streetlights, or are not even lit at all. This isn't too much of a problem because I can just put my high beams on. About 30 minutes of driving, I turned down a road that looked as if it was just a wide path. The GPS said I would be going straight for about 7 miles, and due to knowing about the way New Hampshire roads could be, I didn't think anything of it. The street was like how I mentioned before. It was narrow enough for a car and a half, and was surrounded by the woods and it was not lit with street lights at all. I got about three or four miles in, and saw a guy in my high beams, standing in the middle of the road. He was waving down my car, asking for help. The road wasn't big enough for me to pass around him, so I had to stop. The man then came around to my driver's side window, and gestured for me to put it down. I wasn't fully thinking straight, so I put my window down about halfway. He looked like an average 40 to 45 year old man, but he gave off a disturbing presence. He told me he was having car troubles and asked me to get out of my car and help him. Now, I am a 19 year old and have an average build with brown surfer styled hair. None of my physical qualities hint to me knowing anything about cars. I then told him that I knew nothing about cars and that if he really needed help, all I could do was call a mechanic or tow truck. He kept gesturing to his black rusted pickup truck, and insisted I got out to help him. This started to give me the chills, and I didn't know what to do. That is when I noticed there was someone crouching behind the truck. The man couldn't tell, but I began to internally panic. My fight or flight senses kicked into gear, and I chose to try something risky. I then told the guy I would pull over on the side of the road up ahead and then get out to see what I can help him with. This seemed to work and the guy began to smile. He backed off of my car and I stepped as hard as I could on my gas pedal. I sped off and looked in my rearview mirror to see both men run out into the middle of the road and then just stand there. I kept driving as fast as I could until I got off the road. I got to a nearby gas station where I stopped to call the police. I told the dispatch my experience and asked them if I needed to stick around for questioning. They told me they would send some officers to check out the street and that I was fine to continue on driving. I then called my girlfriend and told her what happened. She was just happy I was safe. 
I have no idea what the intentions of those men were. I don't know if they were actually having car troubles, or if I was going to get carjacked, or worse. Needless to say, after that night, I will not be driving the back roads alone at night anymore. This happened during my first year of community college, and I always drove this shitty 1996 Toyota Corolla to my classes. This car was barely holding it together, and I had to replace some part that broke at least once a month. At 60 miles per hour, the whole car would start to vibrate. But I lived about 10 minutes away from campus and my job, so it got me where I needed to go. One day, I got back from one of my classes, and I noticed someone had broken into my car and misplaced all my possessions. My registration card, homework, tire gauge, and various other objects had been thrown under my seat or stuffed in a weird place. My rearview mirror had been turned completely vertically. Nothing had been stolen, which I thought was really weird, but I was also glad because I thought whoever did this was just doing it for a laugh and trying to mess with me. I started parking on the completely opposite side of campus, but it happened again. Everything in my car was just thrown about. Nothing was stolen. The final time this happened, I was returning to my car from class and saw streamers and confetti all across my windshield. There was a piece of purple construction paper placed inside my windshield wipers that said in all capitals, we are always watching you, with a winky face included. Now this was starting to freak me out. At first, I thought this might be one of my friends playing a prank on me, so I asked all of them over the next few days if they had been breaking into my car and messing around with my stuff. However, none of them knew what I was talking about. I know how my friends are too, and I know if I had asked them about this, and they were indeed the culprit, they would have broke out into laughter and said, Dude, we so totally got you. None of them knew what I was talking about, though. I told them that if this really was one of them, they needed to let me know, because if this was a stranger, I was going to have to get campus security involved. I never felt the need to get them involved any sooner, because none of my possessions had been stolen, and it felt like a practical joke. Things started to get really weird with the confetti, streamers, and note though. A few weeks had passed, and the pranks had stopped much to my relief. I thought that this probably had to be some strangers pulling a prank. Until one night, I was leaving campus after getting out of my class. I was driving down the highway that I always took to my neighborhood, and noticed that I was being tailgated harder than I ever have been in my life. This truck came out of nowhere and was blasting its high beams. It seemed to be about a foot away from the back of my car. I was immediately freaked out and thought, to hell with the law. I booked it back to my house going 90 miles an hour down the highway. The road was pretty clear and there were no cops. And luckily, I lost their tail. The following week, the same situation occurred, leaving my night class and this truck encountering me on the highway, blasting its high beams. I was so sick of the pranks, the stalking, and all of this nonsense, and I had finally had it with whoever was doing this stupid shit. So I slowed down to about 10 miles an hour just to annoy them. I didn't care that all the other cars on the road were honking and giving me the finger for going so damn slow on a highway that at a speed limit of 65, I really just wanted to give whoever the hell this was a taste of their own medicine. No joke, they followed going 10 miles an hour for what felt like 10 minutes. I couldn't understand what this person was getting out of this situation, but after 10 minutes they swerved into the lane next to us and proceeded to speed off into the distance, having finally gotten sick of my own little prank. After this, my car was never messed with again and I believe I may have encountered them only one more time on the same highway. I began to drop below 30 miles an hour, and they immediately swerved into the other lane like they had the last time. Then, 
Finally, our situations of stalking and pranks had finally stopped. I eventually moved out of my old town so I could attend the university I was transferring to. I even traded in my old Corolla for a Honda Civic that was in a much better condition with a different license plate. To this day, I don't know who this person or people were and what they wanted from me. It all could have been harmless, but the fact I was being followed on my way home from campus made it feel like these people wanted something more from me. If I had let them follow me to my home, I have no idea what would have happened. In retrospect, I know I should have gone to campus security or the police about the situation, but after the stalking stopped and I moved away, I forgot about it for a while. Maybe it all really was just harmless pranking, but there is no way for me to be completely sure, and that makes this an extremely creepy experience. I used to be naively helpful to all sorts of strangers, and often picked up hitchhikers, solo and in groups. I helped them get to where they needed to go. When I was 19, I had moved to Huntington, a college town in West Virginia, and I worked at a popular bar. My shifts would start around 9pm and end about 2am. I didn't know anybody in this town or state even, and I'd been there on my own for only a month or so. On one of these nights, one of the customers had taken an interest in conversing with me while I was working my shift. Me, being a good employee, conversed pleasantly back. He was in his thirties or forties, buzzed white hair with a group of other guys, all of them tattooed and with leather jackets. He had been there, going back and forth between them at their table and me at the bar, pretty much talking to me non-stop for a couple of hours. Around 1.30 a.m., he mentions he doesn't know where his friends went. I look up, oblivious, and see the whole bar had virtually cleared out. He was right. Not one of his buddies was inside. He says they must have all gotten drunk and forgotten about him leaving him there. This man is clearly bummed and concerned, but as he tells me, he lives almost an hour away from the bar and has no way of getting home now, and it's the middle of winter, so it's snowing pretty hard. He spends the next few minutes on the phone, calling the different friends that were at the bar with him, but no one is answering. He's clearly screwed. I can't leave him in the bar. I can't in good conscience leave the man out in the snow. So yeah, now I've got to drive this stranger home in a place I'm unfamiliar with, in conditions I've never really driven in before. I tell him don't worry. When I finish cleaning the bar and closing up, I'll take him home. And I do. We get in the car, and he gives me directions as we go. We're talking casually like we had been. Just superficial conversation, nothing even hinting at sexual or flirty. I'm not a flirty person, so I'm positive there was no misunderstanding here. Keep in mind, it's like 2am in the morning, no one knows where I am, or that I'm with this random person, and it's snowing heavily. As we're chatting, I suddenly feel his hand on the back of my neck. It was such an unpleasant feeling. I remember his fingers, swirling in the little hairs at the bottom of my hairline, which were too short to make it into the ponytail. Ugh. I scrunched my neck and just calmly said, I have a knife, as I kept looking forward driving. The swirling ceased, but the hand lingered on my skin. Again, calmly but more firmly I said, I have a knife. He removed his hand and we kept driving. I figure whatever that was is handled, and we get back to our conversation. Minutes later, I feel his hand fully against the bottom of my neck, his fingers wrapped gently around its curve. I scrunched my neck again and said, Seriously, I have a knife. 
I have a knife. He removed his hands once more, and then, in a very hurt tone, he said, Are you really scared of me? After that, he kept his hands to himself. It was a long hour drive, but I got him home and I took off. I am 29 now, and it wasn't until many years later did it occur to me that the whole thing was probably a setup that he and his friends had planned. They probably left him stranded so that the chick he's been talking to all night will have to take him home. Moral of the story, don't let people you don't know into your car. This happened earlier last year and it still messes me up if I think about it too much. First, a bit of backstory to explain. I'm a delivery driver for Uber Eats, and I've been doing it as a sidekick for the past year or so to earn some extra money. Also, I'm a female. Anyway, yeah, Uber Eats. It's a super chill job, although the pay is definitely not ideal, especially at night. Normally, any pings I get after 10 p.m are just shitty fast food orders to customers where the chances of being tipped are even lower than what they already are. Late night deliveries, rarely profitable, which is why I barely do them. However, on this night last year, there was a bonus going on. Reach 15 deliveries in a certain time frame to get an extra 75 bucks. Music to my ears. When? That's the case. Late night deliveries raw because there's no traffic and it doesn't matter where you're picking up from. McDonald's McDonald's. Bring on the bonuses. The faster you can get them done, the faster you get to go home and knock out. Open roads all the way works for me. I was on a roll. I finished my last McDonald's run at 2.30 in the morning. I cashed my bonus and called it a night. For context, this took place in downtown San Diego. Downtown San Diego has fun restaurants and clubs at the core, but as you branch out, it gets more seedy. Once you get past 16th Street, it gets really sketchy. Lots of homeless camps, the works. I actively try to avoid that area, but in order to get back home and on the freeway, I had to pass through that neighborhood. And one other piece of information. I drive a 2002 shitty Ford Focus, and nothing's automatic. In order to roll the windows up or down, you have to reach over and crank the lever. Because it's a hassle to roll them up and down manually each time, when I usually do deliveries, I just keep both my windows rolled down, because it's easier to pick up and deliver through the windows. This night, I had my windows down as usual. I was planning to roll them up before I passed 16th Street, where the homeless camp was, but didn't get that far. As I turned down a side street, heading towards the main drag, up ahead, I see a man in one of those orange reflective construction vests, standing on the side of the road. There's always some sort of construction going on downtown, and it's pretty common for it to happen at night so I didn't really pay much attention. As I got closer though, the man runs into the middle of the street, waving his arms, signaling stop. I start to slow down, thinking he's going to direct traffic or reroute me or something. I break to 10 miles an hour, then 5, leaving distance trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. He breaks out into a jog towards my car, and stops directly in front of it, blocking me and my car from moving forward. I immediately felt uneasy. This is weird. I'm wishing my windows were rolled up. It's 3am on a dark street, and there's not a soul around except for me and this man. People talk about fight or flight, and I've always wondered how I would react in a situation that warranted a similar response. 
Now I know. My reaction is to freeze, because as I was slowing down, it hit me five seconds later than it should have. This guy is not a construction worker. He has a hard hat and a vest, and the creepiest smile I've ever seen in my life. At first, I thought he was just smiling to be friendly, but smiling to acknowledge someone longer than a few seconds is super unnerving. Try it, right now. Count to five in your head while grinning, and you'll see what I mean. That's what this guy was doing. Now that he's in front of me, I can tell he's homeless. That, or just, I don't know. He was an older guy. I would guess around 60s, but homelessness has a way of making everyone look old, so who knows really. He's just staring at me, wild-eyed and smiling, all teeth. Honestly, his smile and mannerisms, the best way I can describe is twisty from American Horror Story. This guy looked insane. I obviously should have reversed but my brain was panicking, and I didn't think that fast. I'm frozen in my car, thinking this is how I die. The whole time, he's not saying anything, just leering. And then, like a ninja, he jumps onto the hood of my car and slams his fist against my hood. I am frozen in terror, just watching this guy. He starts pounding on the hood of my car, crawling around on his hands and knees. Not saying anything, just crawling and staring at me. That was the most terrifying part. He never broke eye contact once during all of this, and he never stopped grinning. The thought of my windows being open made me want to throw up, but at the same time, breaking eye contact and moving to roll them up felt scarier. Like if I made any sudden moves or looked away, he would try to get inside my car, he never said a word. I think it would have been less scary if he said something, but he didn't. He just pounded his fists on the car and stared. In reality, this whole encounter probably lasted all of 15 seconds, but it felt like days. I am freaking out, and before I can gain the sense to do anything remotely intelligent, I see headlights in my rearview mirror coming up behind me from down the street. This man sees them too, and in an instant, he jumps off of my car and breaks off into a run behind me, heading towards the new car. Jesus Christ. I floor it and don't look back until I'm halfway home on the freeway, and at this point, it's all adrenaline. For a long time after that, I stopped delivering at night. I sure as hell don't go to that section of downtown anymore. I take the longer route home, and I don't drive with the windows down at night, if it's in an area even remotely run down. What I realized from this is how naive I can be to just automatically trust and obey someone just because they have a uniform on. I didn't even question slowing down at first, even though the situation was clearly sketchy. In my mind, I was comforted by the fact that somebody trustworthy was on the road. My subconscious thoughts were like, Oh, nice. A public servant doesn't want me to take a wrong turn. By the time I stopped, it would have been already too late if this guy wanted to attack me. I shudder thinking about it. I calm myself down eventually by reassuring myself that this man was probably using something and he meant no harm, which, hopefully, that's the case. And for my own peace of mind, I'm going to believe that. But what got to me is the fact that this guy was dressed as a road worker, on the road, and deliberately behaving at first in a way that led me to believe that he was one. Why else wear that get up? And why are you trying to pull cars over? I don't know the answer and I'm glad I didn't find out what it was that he wanted from me. This happened a few years ago. I was 21 at the time, living with my boyfriend in Illinois, 
Our apartment was on the third and last floor of a building. It was about 8.30 p.m. And I wanted to cook, but I was missing some milk. My boyfriend went to the store to buy some, about 15 minutes away. As he left our apartment and went down the stairs, he left the main door of our apartment building slightly ajar, as he often did, so he wouldn't have to open it back up with keys again. I went to close the blinds, and as I saw him leaving, I saw four guys just running towards our building. They got in and proceeded to run up the three flights of stairs and stand in front of my apartment. My apartment door was locked, they tried to open it, but seeing it was closed, they just banged on the door very loudly. I wasn't sure what to do, so I just yelled, Who is it? We're sellers for a cable company. We have a great offer. Open up. Sorry, I'm not interested. But it is a really good offer. You're really going to miss out on it. I told you I am not interested. Please leave. It went quiet, so I looked through the peephole. I saw them whispering to each other, still standing there. If they were salesmen, why come at 8.30pm? Why directly to my apartment? I yelled again. Please leave or I'm calling the police. I looked through the peephole again, and they're just standing there, laughing and then they just continued banging loudly on my door. At this point, I am a female, alone, and very scared in my own apartment. I called 911, and they told me that a police officer was actually a minute away. They were still there, banging on my door, laughing and calling me names. Once the cops pulled up, all of them just quickly shoved their hands into their pockets and took out an ID with their pictures on them. The IDs had the name of a cable company, and they proceeded to put them on. The cops talked to them for a good ten minutes, and then they left my apartment. The cops then came to my door. They asked me if I felt safe, and told me they were just salesmen trying to sell something. I then tried to tell them that they were banging very loudly. They tried to open my door, and they had no idea around their neck when they showed up to my apartment. They just told me that they're gone now, and it was probably just a selling tactic. To this day, I am not sure of their intentions. Were they just legit salesmen? In that case, why four of them together? And why straight to my door on the third floor? And not taking the time out to knock on anyone else's door like every other salesman? I'm very glad I saw them running. Otherwise, I just would have assumed it was my boyfriend that maybe have forgotten something, and I would have opened straight away. This happened a few weeks ago. I recently graduated from college with a degree in biology, but I decided to take a minute for myself before applying to medical school. My school was in a dangerous area, and I still rent in the area because my roommate is a master's student at the same university. We live about five blocks off campus on a street where you wouldn't want to be caught alone at night. One day, I was by myself in our apartment, jamming to some tunes, and then I heard banging on the door. This was odd to me, because my apartment is a row home style apartment, with two other apartments below me and a front door which I had most certainly locked behind me when I entered the building about 10 minutes prior. It was also concerning because I'm a 5 foot tall woman and currently alone. Since we live on the top floor, nobody but my roommate and I are ever up on the third floor and I had not recently submitted a maintenance request. I turned the music off and sat still for a moment, waiting to see if it happened again. The banging started once more. Now, I recognize that this was stupid, but I walked to the front door and opened it the tiniest crack to see a large, dirty, heavy-set man with a beard on the other side. I asked, Can I help you? He looked me in the eye and said, I'm here to fix the air conditioning leak. 
You need to let me inside the unit so I can make the repairs. My management company only has one regular maintenance worker, who I was familiar with, and I had never seen the man standing at my door previously. He took a step forward while I quickly said, Wrong place. I slammed and locked the door. Initially, I wasn't too concerned, because maybe he's in the wrong place. I emailed my landlord to ask about the maintenance reps in the area, to which she replied, the company had a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning technician out today, but none to your address. What did he look like? After describing him as a large, heavier white male with a full beard, she responded, That was not our rep. He is a small, thin man. I am not sure who was out there. Now I'm worried about my safety, because clearly someone has keys to our building, and even my management company cannot account for who he may have been. They will also not change the front door locks, so I'm kind of on my own with this one. This happened to me a little while ago. My parents had gone out of town and left me at home. It was fine for the first few days playing video games, watching TV, you know, the normal teen stuff. One day, I'm sitting in my room around 7 at night, when I hear someone knocking at my door. Normally, my grandmother, who lives just down the road, would come over and check up on me, and say goodnight and stuff. So, thinking it's her, I get up to let her in. I open my main door, and see that it's not my grandmother, but a man. He looked mid-30s, and he was kind of chubby. He held a clipboard and just stared at me till I said anything to him. Hello? I ask in a weirded out voice. Hi, I'm from the furnace company, and I'm here to check your furnace. As he said this, he tried forcing me away to let him in. I stood my ground and said to him, My parents are not here right now. Can you come back later? His eyes lit up when he found out I was home alone. Just let me check. I gotta make sure it's all fired up. That's when I checked the van he had. It was an unmarked green van. Normally all companies in my town have a logo, and I mean all. I'm not letting you in. My yell somewhat startled him as he took a step back, and I was able to get in and lock the outer door, keeping him out. I grabbed my cell phone and called my grandmother, and I told her what happened. As I told her, the guy ran back to the van and sped off. I'm horrified to think what would have happened if I never scared him. This encounter happened when I was about 10 years old. My sister and I were home alone since it was during the summer. Both our mom and grandmother were busy, so they couldn't stay home with us. We were used to being home alone during the summer, so it was not a big deal. The only thing we could not do was go outside or open the door if someone knocked. During this day, I had gotten up and started to play The Sims 2 in our kitchen, and my sister was watching TV in our den. A few hours into gaming, I thought I heard the doorbell ring. At first I thought it was my game, but I had turned off the sound. So I asked my sister if she heard the doorbell, and she replied she hadn't. She said it was probably just the show she was watching. I brushed it off and went back to playing my game. About ten minutes later, I see a reflection on my computer of a man in a suit. His hands cupped around his eyes, looking through the glass doors behind me. I turn around to be face to face with this strange man I've never seen before. I had no idea how long he'd been watching me. He waved at me like he knew me from somewhere. I called my sister's name, who had not noticed the man yet. She grabs the house phone, quickly calling our grandmother. Now we had seen salespeople before, but none of them looked like this guy. He was wearing a full-on black suit that did not fit him. If that's not strange enough, this guy was wearing a full-on suit in 99 degrees, and he was also carrying a briefcase. 
All the salespeople I had ever seen only had a clipboard, or maybe a couple of flyers, but this man had a briefcase. And the next flag that came with this guy is that he walked around our house to come to the back door. And during his little trip, he would have seen that there wasn't a car in the driveway, indicating that no one was home. As I was getting up to hide, the man reached down and grabbed the doorknob, and then he started to jiggle it forcefully. Thankfully, the door was locked. He looks at me, smiling. He then gestured to me to come and unlock the door for him. All the noise he had been making now set off our 75-pound lab mix, making her go batshit crazy. There was no way she was going to let this guy get to us if he did get in. My sister tells our grandmother, who is now on her way. She wanted us to hide in the back of the house in her room until she got home. My sister hands me the phone and then runs into the kitchen to grab the biggest knife we have. I can hear her yelling at the guy that we call the cops. She comes back into the room with me and we shut the door. She tells me after she lied to the guy about calling the cops. She said that he started laughing like she told the funniest joke he had ever heard. A little while later we heard the door open and then my grandmother calling out to us. We come out to meet her. She tells us she could not see anyone inside. She had walked around the whole house before unlocking the door. She also thought it was weird that if he was a salesperson, he would have left a note saying, Sorry we missed you. She ended up taking the rest of the day off work to stay with us, and also to see if the man would come back. It's been 11 years since this encounter, and I still don't want to know what was in his briefcase. Growing up, I always had the front or back door open with a latch screen or glass door to let in some light or air. I was used to that, and it never occurred to me when I got my own place to do anything less. Several years ago, when I moved into my first rental, I was just cleaning up and unpacking things, and as it was summer, I had the door open with the glass door latched. Eventually, I heard the neighbor's dog start barking and then a knock at my door. Standing outside was a guy who looked pretty normal, although his behavior was slightly anxious. That didn't seem too weird, though, because he was selling magazine subscriptions to make extra money. At the time, I had more than one person come to the door saying that, although before it had usually been high school students. This guy was probably 30 or so, which made it a bit awkward. I told him I was sorry, but I didn't have any money. I closed and latched the door again, and he walked off. I wasn't at all afraid or nervous. I actually thought he was nervous or embarrassed to be so much older than people who usually get jobs like that. So I went about my day, perfectly normal. I went into the kitchen and unpacked and put away stuff. I decided I didn't want to mess it all up by cooking yet, so I grabbed my keys and went down the stairs. An honest-to-God chill went up my back, raising the hairs on my arms when I saw the door. There were greasy prints all over it, not just handprints, but prints from a face. They were squished around as the guy tried to see from different angles into my house. I immediately closed the door and locked it. I then called my uncle and his son to come hang out with me for a while. Luckily, I never saw him again, but I never unlocked the glass door if someone knocked. I just talked to them through it. Me and my roommate, who are both females in our late 20s, just moved into this apartment, and yesterday was our one-month anniversary of living here. It's located in Ontario. It was a great neighborhood, a little touristy, not a bad area. The building is in great shape, but old, and many tenants have told us they've lived there for 20 plus years. We were assured the locks were changed before we moved in. I have a key, as does my roomie, 
and so do the odd couple that take care of the building and the general maintenance guy. So, to the story. I was the last to leave the apartment at around 8am and I locked the door. My roommate got home around 4.30pm and unlocked the door, changed, and then left to go run some errands. We both got home around 6pm. The first thing I did was go to my room to change out of my work clothes, and I noticed that my closet looked messy. I had a small box of knickknacks, notebooks, tissue paper, lip gloss, junk drawer stuff. It looked like it had fallen onto the floor of my closet. However, the box was then put back up and some of my dirty clothes from my basket were inside. It looked like someone had rummaged through my dirty laundry and tossed clothes out of their way, which probably caused the box full of stuff to fall in the first place. On top of that, brand new clothes I had just purchased were still hung up, but hanging in the way like someone was quickly sliding the clothes on the bar and flipped some into the box. Because I'm very neat and tidy, I knew right away this was not right. I did not do this. So I began to rationalize. Did my roommate do this? No, why would she? She wouldn't do this. If she needed something, she'd ask. Did I do this? Maybe I threw my pants in the closet and it landed in the box. Maybe I did leave this stuff on the floor. Oh well, weird. But anyways, that was pretty much my inner dialogue. Cut to about 9.45pm. I'm in my room and all of a sudden I hear my roommate call my name, loudly, and in a tone of voice I've never heard before. I go to her room and she said, I found the gift you left me. I say I don't understand the present in my pillow. I look at her from the hall and say I have no idea what she's talking about. I go into her room and on her bed is a dildo. It was mine. I grab it and then say to her, that's mine. Why is it in here? It was in my pillow. You didn't put it there. She replied. I tell her it was mixed in with my laundry basket. That's where I leave it to remind myself to wash it within a day or so. Now the wheels are turning, and things are starting to come together. Someone must have let themselves into our apartment with the key, went into my room, looked through my dirty laundry, found the toy mixed in there, and then put it inside her pillowcase so she'd find it when she went to bed. After being in shock for a few minutes, the reality sunk in and I started to cry. Someone had access to our apartment for at least the last month. We decided to talk to the building managers, and while they seemed to want to comfort me because I was an emotional mess, the husband mostly played it down, saying it was probably a joke, and then asked if we gave a copy of our key to anyone. I think it was part culture and age that made them downplay it. We did call the cops, and they came within an hour or so. They took all of our information, we told them the full story, and then they had a look around. Honestly, they can't do much, and I figured that at least we have a paper trail. I definitely mentioned the handyman guy as the one they should talk to. They're going to follow up with some residents and the building staff. I also watched the property manager and the handyman change my locks. If anything seems out of place then it's very clear it's either the staff or someone who has access to their apartment. We're getting a camera that we can attach somewhat discreetly and hopefully it never catches anyone that should not be in our apartment. I was diagnosed with agoraphobia about three years prior to this story. So while this may not seem very scary to many people, it was for me. And yes, I do take medication for my panic attacks for when I must leave the house. Or if someone unknown needs to come, I did take my pill. Often before the onset of an attack, the back of my neck becomes really hot. You can feel the heat coming off of it before contact on the skin. It was the beginning of another Texas summer heat wave many years ago. 
We started having several issues with our cable service. I called and arranged for someone to come to the house again. We had three to four previous people out to try to fix our issues, but those fixes never really remained fixed. So the day arrives that the repair person is supposed to show up. I'm a bit anxious, as always, when expecting someone, but my college-aged son was home sleeping, and I felt pretty okay. So the dogs start barking, and I know the repair person has arrived. I go to the front and look out the small window in the door. I see a white van with the cable company's name, and I wait at the door for them to approach. It takes about ten minutes or so. I figured he was on the phone or something, or doing some paperwork for his job. He gets up to the front door and knocks. I open the front door and he holds up his company ID and tells me his name. It matches and I unlock the screen door to let him in. I show him the three rooms that are having issues and he seems friendly and makes small talk as I finally lead him around to the back family room and I ask him to wait there so I can put the dogs outside. He does and I tell him it's okay but he does not enter. I finally go around to the front of the house to see if he heard me, and as I turn the corner out of the kitchen, he sees me and starts to kind of smile shyly a little bit. I think to myself, okay, maybe he was snooping in the bookshelves or something. I'm not really scared at this point, I just think he's a bit kooky, but I do notice that the foyer window blinds are swaying a bit. But we have cats, so it didn't really catch my full attention. So I point to the kitchen and this time follow behind him to the family room. He checks out the outlet and says he needs to grab another bag from his van. He heads to the front of the house and out the door. I clean a couple of dishes and load them in the dishwasher while waiting. He returns with a brown leather bag, much like an old doctor's bag, and then starts working on the outlet in the living room, right off the front side of the kitchen. I move into the family room and straighten up a bit. My recliner and coffee table had to be moved at an angle so he could reach the cable outlet. I wasn't in there maybe two minutes when he sauntered into the family room with his brown bag. It was like a switch had gone off. His demeanor was very different. He seemed, well, there's no other way to say it, very proud of himself. I quirked an eyebrow and asked if he had already finished in the living room and office. He smiled very big and nodded, saying, I'm quick like that when I want to be. As he is speaking, he is walking directly and purposely straight at me. I was trying to back up out of his way, but the coffee table was behind me, so I just kind of slid into the recliner before he walked into me. He grinned. Again, no other word comes to mind than wickedly. He sets his unopened bag on the coffee table which kind of pissed me off, but I was getting more nervous now and started feeling really warm. I also noticed the normal tool belt most of these guys wear is where he was getting his parts and tools from. He continued the smile as he knelt and removed the old outlet. He stood up and dug around for stuff in his belt, the whole time facing me directly. I began to fan myself with my hands. My face was getting warm, and he laughed and asked, do I make you nervous? He reached down and moved his bag closer to him, but didn't open it. I just kind of half smiled and was fixing to get up. He moved in front of the recliner and sat on the edge of the coffee table. He leaned in and asked me, Are you alright? Do you need a glass of water or something? Whilst leering at me. I shook my head and said, No, it's fine. Just kind of hot in here. He set down the cable wire and crimping tool he was holding and started waving his hands as if he was fanning me. He half stood up and leaned over me. He was fanning the back of my neck. I leaned to the side away from him and said, No, it's really fine. I then tried to slide out of my recliner. He put his hands on my shoulder and said, No, you shouldn't get up. You might pass out. I was scared now. This guy had actually touched me. He forced me back into a sitting position. I thought about yelling for my son, but then I thought, God, what if he had been in my son's room, or did something to his door, 
or something when he was at the front of the house. I totally freaked out in my head. All these scenarios were screaming at me to do something, but I just froze, sure that if I screamed out to my son, the guy would kill us both. So I just sat there, trying to figure out what to do without alerting him that I was scared. I pulled the top of my shirt near the collar up to my face, which was now profusely sweating. I wiped my cheeks. His hand snaked out and grabbed the front of my collar. He pulled it towards him and he bent down and started blowing into my shirt. His face practically buried inside my shirt. I pulled back and was somehow now basically squatting in the recliner, facing to the side and he's just standing there smiling at me and says, It's okay. It's okay. He picks up the cable and finishes crimping the end on it, and then backs up to the wall, still totally facing me. He screws the plate on the cable and looks away momentarily, and I mean like two seconds to place the screws in the plate into the wall, then just keeps staring and smiling like it was some kind of role-playing game, and that I was his girlfriend customer as he screwed the plate into the wall. The whole time I'm squatting on the recliner, shaking so badly, the damn thing is actually rocking. I'm mentally trying to prepare myself for a fight. He straightened up, having finished screwing the plate into the wall. He then takes two steps, still holding the crimping tool. I couldn't keep my eyes from switching back and forth, between his right hand reaching for his back and the left, now holding the crimps. I was just starting to kind of raise up. I guess I was going to try to tackle him or something. I'm really not sure. All I could think of was I couldn't let him find out my son was there. Just then, my 100 pound rot chow mix, Lily, decided she was tired of being outside. And as per her normal attitude, she slammed her paws against the back door, not three feet away, which always makes the window shake and rattle like an earthquake or a tornado was coming. This sudden, very loud noise made us both jump, and I stepped off the recliner and was at the door in a millisecond. He started to move towards me, but his eyes shot to my hand on the deadbolt, turning it. The click was so loud, it was like lightning had struck in the backyard. He laughed, actually laughed, and grabbed his bag off the coffee table and started to walk sideways, moving past me into the kitchen, and seconds later, I heard the front door slam open, and then the screen door open and close. I let the three dogs in, Lily, Chica, and Helix. They all ran straight into the living room and were barking and jumping on the screen door. I knew it was safe because Lily did not like men very much, unless they were introduced to her. I went into the living room and now actually noticed the blinds that I had opened earlier are actually closed now. I rushed to lock the screen in front door, and then I called my husband who was at work. I could barely talk. He rushed home and called the police. Here's the worst part. They came and took my statement and asked a bunch of questions. I had to detail everything that happened to me. They then asked if I was on meds or if I had any mental issues. I was still shaking and sweating badly. My husband shot them a look of confusion but I told them I was agoraphobic and took medication for it. The cops then looked at each other, closed the notebook, and they both stood up and said I could get a police report in about a week, and if we had any other issues, we could call 911. They then left. Now here's the best part. We called the company and talked to a supervisor. He was there with different police officers of some type within 45 minutes. They brought a photo lineup with eight guys on it and asked me if I could pick the guy out. They set the paper on the table. Before the officer could finish saying, take your time, I had already pointed to the guy. I told them again what had transpired. They thanked us and apologized over and over during the course of the conversation. They said they would investigate it and they would contact us as soon as they concluded it. The next morning, I got a call from the supervisor. He told me that they had pulled the guy from any remaining jobs he had that day, and they had just completed their investigation. They informed him he no longer had a job, and this incident was part of his work record. This happened three years ago, but requires some background. 
My best friend and I grew up in a sleepy, wannabe New Jersey Central Florida town, and we were the outcasts. We had met in sixth grade when I'd overheard her talking to another classmate about bionicles, my eleven-year-old self's passion. We became fast friends and soon were inseparable. Soon began the gauntlet of sleepovers, birthday parties, and family gatherings. We were practically siblings. She was the first person I'd come out to as bisexual, and in turn, I was the first person she told about being trans. Her home life was tumultuous, though I can't say mine was any better. We often had a habit of taking refuge at each other's houses. Like I said, we'd become like siblings. Her father was an alcoholic, strict, and prone to physical discipline. Her sister was a stuck-up girl who gravitated towards the hicks and jocks when we entered high school, and her mother was a pseudo-vegan hippie love child held over from the 80s. When I was 23, herself 22 at the time, we had another long night of sleeping over in order to let her escape yet another fight with her mother. She had recently lost her job at Walmart, and I was going in to my first shift at Taco Bell the next day. On the drive home the next morning, she excitedly told me that since she now had her own vehicle, she would be applying at a pizza place that were in need of a driver. I was proud. It was the first time she hunted for a job on her own, as I'd usually been the one to coax her to apply where I was working. Not that she'd ever lasted very long. My first training day goes by quite well. My co-workers are friendly and try to get me to talk more. My manager likes to playfully embarrass me. It was a fat white guy by trying to get me to talk hood to the other workers. Being a training day, it wasn't a very long shift, but I had been up early in anticipation, and this was my first day on a job in a few months. I got home around noon, informed some of my internet friends that my first day went well, and around 5pm I start to bed down, drained from a good day. As I'm preparing to lay in my bed, I get a steam message. Her lamenting another fight with her mother and asking if she could come over. Now, I had started to grow a bit weary of the fights on their end. I had began to repair my relationship with my family and a few friends, and I had given her advice many times on how better to approach things. In my infinite wisdom and eagerness to sleep, I left the message on red and drift off into a slumber. Around 8pm, I am awakened by her bursting into my room in a panic. Having just been ripped from a dream, I am groggy and disorientated. I drag myself to the bathroom to relieve my bladder and come back to my room to find her rocking back and forth on my bed. It is at this time I notice she is covered in blood. So I ask what happened. She informs me that she just saw someone murder her mother with a knife. My mind goes blank. In the deepest parts of my mind, Alarm bells start ringing. Isn't the rocking back and forth a bit overdramatic? Why didn't she call the police? But this is my best friend. I've known her for over a decade, and we were the only two people in the world we could count on. I suppress it and go and inform my sister and stepfather. My mother had passed the year prior, and it was roughly a month to the anniversary of her death. We were all in a dark place, antisocial as always. It was the only way that we knew how to handle emotional issues. When I informed my family, they immediately go to the same place as I had, so they are far more vocal about it. I offer excuses I know myself were flimsy and return to the room with the phone in hand. I convinced her to call the police, and I can hear her explain the details over the phone. A man in a black ski mask. When the cops arrive, she swears up and down that it's most likely her father. They send cars over to check the crime scene and take her in for a statement. I ride with her in the back of the cop car over to the sheriff's office. It gets to be around 2am. Her sister was brought in, as was her father. I have work the next morning and request to be taken home by a police officer. It takes me a while to go to sleep that morning. The next day at work, I am quiet until my manager asks me what happened. I inform him, but decide to work the rest of my training shift. When I get home, 
My sister informs me she had confessed. Her mother threatened to kick her out for not being able to find a job, and in a rage she had taken a kitchen knife and stabbed her repeatedly. My mind froze like a bad computer, and I turned to face my monitor. I was in a Discord call at the time, and all I could weakly say is, my best friend confessed to murdering her mother before hanging up and laying on my bed. Her last trial was the 7th of this month. I don't know the results, though my grandmother tells me she took a plea deal for life in prison rather than a death penalty. Part of me wants to contest that, to demand they take the death penalty for ridding the earth of such a peaceful and caring woman's shadow. A larger part of me is just glad she's being punished. Natalie, you were my best friend, my sister, and my platonic soulmate. But please, let's never meet again. I work at my local county animal shelter. I've done it for a few years. It's pretty much what I was meant for. The way the block is set up, it's like one winding stretch of county buildings. Basically, there's everything on this block from doctors to the homeless shelter, so this block has some interesting characters. No biggie, I live in a pretty shit area, so crazy stuff happens all the time. Someone jumped out of their car and stabbed someone in a different car in traffic in front of me last year, and it didn't even make the news. It took cops almost 30 minutes to get there, so the cops suck here too. Back on track. My job lets me bring my dog to work, which is awesome. He just hangs out with me or gets put in a doggy play group with his friends, depending on my day's activity level. He's super nice to everyone, but he can be a little intimidating to some people at first, which is understandable, since he's a 95 pound Doberman and they get a bit of a bad rap. So a few days ago, I was in the front office on my own since my coworker was on a break. Two guys come in, right off the bat, in my head I'm like, damn, these guys are high. Whatever, it happens, we're located next to a large college, it's to be expected. Anyway, one of the guys starts asking about volunteering, because he has some community service hours due for some law breaking thing he did, and I point him in the direction of the coordinator who does that. He goes. The other guy stays and starts making idle conversation. Then, out of nowhere, he starts telling me how hot I am and asks for my last name. I had to give him my first name because it's engraved on my shirt, but I lied about my last name. I should have just told him I wasn't comfortable with giving my last name, but I have too nice syndrome, and honestly, I didn't want to be harassed further for saying no, seeing as I have been in the past. So the other guy comes back, they leave and I take my break. Lo and behold, not ten minutes into my break, I get a text from my coworker saying the guys had come back in looking for me, and not to come back into work. They leave about twenty minutes later. I was in the clear. So fast forward, the day's pretty much done and I'm just closing up shop. A different coworker than the one I worked with up front comes in and sees I'm hurrying to leave. He asks me if I want him to take the dog out to a yard we have in the front of our property to do his business. I appreciate it and agree. My coworker says I'll put him in my car too, seeing as it's parked next to his and he doesn't mind. I say sure, since I have a few binders to carry out anyway. I hand him my key and off they go. He brings me my key back like 15 minutes later. I am the last to leave for the night, besides two co-workers who were staying overnight, until someone releases them in the morning. It's about 8 and already dark here, and the parking lot we have is so small that employees have to find street parking. As I'm about halfway to my car, I can hear some low talking and footsteps behind me. It doesn't ring any bells at first, there are quite a few buildings and stuff on the street, and homeless people mill about later at night but they're pretty much harmless, so I just keep on trucking. Not that many steps later, I hear the steps speed up, 
and then a hand on my shoulder. The hand stopped me so abruptly, I ended up dropping my binders with loose papers I just organized, so I'm a bit annoyed now. I turn and freeze when I see it's the two guys from earlier. Did you need something? I asked while a sinking feeling set in for some reason. I just wanted to know why you lied to my brother here about your name. You like them stuck up birches who think they're too good. The guy who wanted to volunteer asked me. I stood there with my mouth like a fly trap. I had no idea how he knew I lied when the other guy answered for me. He found me on Facebook from searching my work and saw me. So I came up with the smoothest lie I could. And I said I'm not allowed to give out my full name to customers for county law safety regulations. They look like they believed it. While I'm saying all this, I see this man's hand resting on his pocket, and I suddenly take in that they both have decent sized pocket knives halfway concealed. I carry one myself for work, just in case an animal ever gets caught on a leash or something, and we need to free them quickly, or maybe if they come in with a collar embedded in their skin and it's cutting off their oxygen. But I am a 21 year old girl that is 5 foot 2 and 100 pounds. I'm not doing shit to two guys if it came down to it. I know that. So now I'm wanting to cry while the other guy is going on about how it's good I'm not stuck up because they don't like stuck up girls. They think they all should be taught a lesson in mannerisms. I am desperately trying to think of a way of how to get out. No one's around. I don't want to use my phone to call 911 or anyone in front of them, and I'm almost to my car, so I don't want to risk going back to work. And the guy who's got the hearts for me is staring at me like a damn Christmas ham, so I want to puke. They then tell me about this party they're going to, and I should come since I'm a good girl, and good girls go to parties with them. The way the volunteer guy said it, made it seem like an order and not a request. The hairs on the back of my neck went up. So I get an idea while he's talking, and I just pray to God it works. I force a relaxed smile and agree, saying I just have to put my binders in my car or my boss will kill me. They look stoked on my agreement and proceed to follow me to my car. It's too dark to see inside the windows, and streetlights are rare on this side of town. The businesses are pretty spaced, so the streets are not well lit. I get to the back door of my car, open it, and I smile when I see my dog's head pop up from the trunk out of his slumber. Before I even make a sound, his ears go back and he starts growling. I hear one of the guys say, What is that? And that's all it took for my dog to get up and lunch for them, doing his best to get his large body between me and the door. I grab his collar and let him jump out of the car, out in front of me. And let me tell you, he starts going nuts. He's got St. Bernard drool flying out of his mouth. He's snapping, barking, and growling. The guys back up and tell me we can't bring my dog to the party and to put the deranged mud back in the car. I hold back from rolling my eyes and apologize, saying I'm just going to give him some dog food I keep in the glove box. I shut the door and open the front door. My dog will not get in. He just keeps snapping and growling at the two guys. So I keep hold of his collar and I get in the driver's side first. Then I call him in. Thankfully, he reluctantly follows. I shut the door as soon as his ass was in the passenger seat. Then I hit the locked doors button and turn on my car. As soon as I do that, they know I'm not about to go to some party with their dumb asses, and they start banging on my window. My dog goes into rage mode and hops in the back seats and starts going ballistic, all while I'm peeling out of there, really not caring if I hit one of them. Once I'm down the street a bit, I see them in the rearview mirror, just watching my car. I took the opposite direction in which I normally go home, just to make myself feel better, even though I have an hour commute home. As soon as I got home, I deactivated my Facebook. I told my boss the next day over the phone what happened, and now they're working on transferring me to one of our two other shelters in the county, which is pretty sweet, 
because all of them will still be a shorter commute, but it still sucks to be too afraid to go into work. To begin, I have always had this feeling that someone was watching me ever since I moved into my family house eight years ago. At first, I thought I'd just watched too much ID investigation and that I was just being paranoid, but I could not help looking over my shoulder when I would walk to school or to my bus stop. When I would walk to school, I was always scared in the morning when it would be dark during the winter or fall because where I live is just vast country lands. I live in Canada. And although not much crime happens in my neighborhood, I never could rid myself of this eerie feeling, even when I would come home from school. Being home alone did not help. I would triple check my windows and locks to make sure everything was locked. However, in my basement, our garage door would never fully lock, since the hinge on the door was broken and detached from the door. Therefore, it would never properly close. I always told my dad to fix this door, but because he would always go away for work, he never found the time to do so. Stupidly, I thought nothing bad would happen, since my garage needed a four-digit passcode to get in. For a side note, I just want to let everyone know that never, under any circumstances, put your birthday as a passcode for anything, even if you switch up the dates that the day is first and the month is second. Do not do it because it will be obvious. Now my theory is that he knew the passcode to my house, therefore he had free reign for seven years to go through my things. At first I thought I was being forgetful. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my underwear somewhere. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my favorite top. Or maybe my dad accidentally donated it, but I should have known better. During my four years in high school, he never really contacted me. It was when I went to university that things started to change. Since I live in the countryside, I decided to go to a university an hour away. My dad didn't want me to live on residence because he didn't want to leave the house unattended for long periods of time. So we came to the conclusion that it would be best if I drive to and from school. Now I would leave for university very early in the morning and I'd be back around 6 p.m. at night. I stopped being aware of my surroundings at this time because I would be tired from my 12-hour days, and now that I wasn't walking alone, everything would be fine. When I would come home from university, I would find certain things moved in my house. I might have mild OCD, so I like things a particular way in my house. When little things like my makeup or candles would be moved, I thought it was odd, and I would frequently bring it up with my dad, but he just said it must have been me who was doing it but it wasn't me. During my second and third year in university, I started getting weird notes in my mailbox. The writing on these notes looked almost childlike and it would always be written in blue ink. I have those country style mailboxes at the end of my driveway where the little flag goes up whenever we get mail. From my way back from university, I would always check the mail and sometimes I would find these letters. The letters would never be long. In fact, there would only be one to three sentences that would contain odd questions like, Where are you? I wonder what you do while you're away from home. How do you find university? It must be tiring driving that long. Did you make new friends? Do you still hang out with your best friend? You dress differently now. Why is that? I miss the scarves you used to wear. You don't close your curtains as much anymore. Why don't you look for me? These letters would always come once a month, at the beginning of the month. I would show my dad, and at first he would say, Oh, maybe your cousins are just pranking you, or it could probably be your friends. But every time I would ask my friends or cousins, they would give me this confused response, saying that they never sent me any letters. Now that I am in my fourth year at university, the letters don't come as frequently, but two weeks ago something happened. That makes me think things are escalating. I came back home from university at 7.45 p.m. It was fairly dark outside. I saw that my mailbox flag was up, so I checked the mail and it was just the bills. At this point, I haven't gotten a note for a little over three months now, so I'm thinking that maybe these notes won't come anymore. As I settle in for bed, 
I change into my pajamas, and I check the locks as usual. As I check my front door lock, I looked out of the glass panel of my door, and I saw that the red flag of my mailbox was up. It was 10.30 at night. There was no way the mail could have been dropped off that late. I had just checked the box. I call my dad and tell him about it, and he said not to freak out. Maybe one of our neighbors accidentally got our mail and just dropped it off since this happens frequently. I stay on the phone with my dad as I quickly run down my driveway to check my mailbox. As I open the mailbox, I feel my heart drop because it's an unmarked manila envelope. I quickly run back inside and open the manila envelope and although there is no written note, I find something more disturbing. It's a pair of my old blue panties that I haven't seen in years. At this point I scream, and my dad tells me to hang up and call my aunt who's a police officer. My aunt comes over and checks the inside and outside of my house, but she can't find anything. She tries to jog my memory and asks if I know anyone who could be doing this, but I honestly have no clue. My aunt told me to keep any more letters I get and she has been staying with me the days my dad is out for work. My dad is thinking about installing security cameras, and hopefully we can catch whoever is doing it that way. But what else can I do? I am so paranoid and scared, because I don't know who this person is. But I know he's been stalking me for a while. Those panties he sent me were ones I had while I was in high school, and I lost that pair when I was in grade 10. The fear of the unknown is getting to me so much that my anxiety is not letting me function normally. I just don't know what to do. Thirteen to fourteen years ago, when I was around twelve or thirteen, my family had a gathering at my grandma's house, which we did very often back then. My brother, cousins, and I were playing in the inflatable pools in the backyard. For a bit of context, I was the only female. The neighbor kid, probably my brother's age, 15 or 16, climbed his fence so he could talk to us. We were having fun joking and chatting with him, so he asked if he'd like to join us. My grandma gave the okay, and he came over to partake in the festivities. Everything was great until my cousins and brother went inside to help with something. I got nervous when they left, but I'm a socially anxious person who is especially nervous around guys, so I pushed it aside. Suddenly, the cool kid from next door became a jerk. He started hurling insults at me while grinning. I figured he was just playing around, so I did it back. We started splashing each other, but then he got super aggressive. He was splashing me so much I kept taking in water. I turned my head away and told him to slow down, still kind of laughing. When he didn't stop, I got serious and told him to knock it off. He stopped. I was clearing my eyes of water when he grabbed the bucket. He filled it with water and put the bucket on my head. I went to take it off, but he shoved me down. I got the bucket off and asked what's wrong with them. He just grabbed me and shoved my head under water. I was failing, searching for his face to scratch or hit, but the angle he was at made it impossible. I got dangerously close to passing out when he was pulled off of me. I came up gasping for air and my brother pulled me behind him. He asked the kid what the hell he's doing. The little douche snickered and said we were just playing. My brother stepped forward and asked how trying to drown me is playing. The kid kept smirking, and my brother told him he needs to stay away from us. The kid scoffed and angrily said, You guys are boring anyway. He was escorted out by my sibling. We never said anything to the adults for reasons I can't understand, but that kid kept taunting us in his backyard. He even brought one of his friends to mock us and insult us which resulted in us telling our family, so that stopped real quick. He tried to call us liars, but wasn't believed. Shortly after that, the family moved out, and we never dealt with him again. 
and I'm very grateful for my brother, who essentially raised me. He's helped me in more ways than I can count. I don't know where I'd be without him. I work in an art supply store, and I've had my fair share of weird customers, both good and bad. But there's one who will always stand out in my mind as someone who genuinely terrified me. I was closing one night, and it had already started getting dark. I was on register with one other person. A guy wearing a backpack approached me, asking if I knew where the calligraphy ink was. I told him it was on the very last aisle on the left. The man asked me if I could show him where it was. This was not an uncommon request, and there was someone else at the register, so I told him that I'd be happy to and lead him over to the aisle. When we got to the aisle with the ink, he walked over to the low shelf I pointed him to, but didn't pick up anything or bend down to get a closer look. He just stood there, staring into space in the general direction of the shelf, he asked me if I could show him the ink. It was at this moment that I started to feel like something was off with this dude. He seemed to have zero interest in the item he had requested I show him. I looked closer. I noticed his hand was in his pocket at a weird angle, and his fly was down. I was suddenly very hyper aware of how far away the aisle was from anybody else in the store, and how it was a bit darker than the other aisles. I knew there were security cameras trained on this aisle because of the price of some of the items, but I doubted anyone was actually looking at it. Had he asked me to come to this part of the store on purpose, I was desperately trying to hide my rising panic behind a customer service smile so as not to tip off the guy that I knew there was something wrong. The man asked about another item, and I told him what aisle he could find it on. He asked me again if I can show it to him. I tried a couple of times to say, Oh, you can't miss it. It's just a few aisles down to the left. He insisted I needed to show him. I'm right behind you, I said. The man responded by insisting I walk in front of him, even though I had tried to direct him to the aisle without leading him there myself. I began walking towards the aisle, and I realized the path I was taking was blocked by a large ladder, a ladder the man wouldn't be able to get past but I would. I took off running, squeezed past the ladder, and dodged into an aisle, immediately finding another customer and asking them if they needed any help. As I was trying to stall by talking to the customer, I noticed the man walk past the aisle several times, back and forth. I realized he must have been waiting for the people to leave, or for me to walk out of the aisle alone. I frantically radioed my manager to meet me at the aisle. I told him about the man who had been following me. He responded by saying he saw him leave the store and then walk off to a nearby fast food chain. I tried to laugh him off as some random weirdo, but I was shaking for the rest of the night. Funnily enough, when we were later discussing weird customers we'd seen, someone described a guy who sounded vaguely similar to the man coming in. This time, wheeling around a random old rusty shopping cart full of backpacks and abandoning it in the store. Apparently, this guy did this multiple times and got angry when confronted about it. I can't help but wonder if it's the same weirdo, and if so, why the hell is he hanging around in an art supply store? This story happened to me when I was a kid and it is probably one of the creepiest stories I have to tell. I think I was about 9 or 10 when this happened. It was definitely my birthday, because we had the party at a nearby park. I think it had been raining, but I was still excited that it was my birthday. We all had a good time, and me and my brother opened our presents and ate cake. The only day kids love as much as their birthday is Christmas and I was really happy with all the presents my friends had gotten me. By the time the party was over, it had stopped raining, and the sun was starting to come out. We picked up everything and put the presents in the car, and we started to drive back home. 
The exit to the rather large car park we had been at goes through this big fancy metal gate and opens up to a circular intersection. We pulled into the intersection and took a left towards the state highway. Everything seemed nice and normal at first, until we stopped at a crosswalk down the road from my street. I noticed my dad looking in the rearview mirror, and he muttered something to my mom. We kept driving and turned down my street then into my driveway. I unbuckled and turned around to see what was the matter. I watched as my dad walked to a red car, maybe a sedan or a Prius. He spoke to the lady driving it. We all watched as she sped away. I remember getting really scared and my mom brought me and my brothers inside while my father called the cops. An officer arrived at our house shortly after and my dad told him what had happened. Apparently, when we stopped at the crosswalk, he noticed the lady in the car behind ours filming us. He watched to see if she followed us, which she did, of course. When we got home and he approached her, all she said was, I got what I want. The officer assured us that a lot of people like to film the stuff around them, as this was the time when cameras like GoPros were becoming popular. To this day, I'm still not sure why exactly that lady filmed us. Maybe we cut her off at the intersection, or she didn't notice us stopping at the light ahead, breaking just in time to prevent a fender bender and blaming it on us. We never heard anything of her again, but I sometimes wonder if she'll come back. Okay. So this is a story about the strangest birthday I've ever had. For context, I'm from Germany, and the legal age to drink here is 16, for beer and wine. It's 18 for liquors. So, on the day I turned 18, me and my best friend decided to go out to our near city to grab some drinks at a local bar, one that is quite popular. But since it was a Tuesday night, there weren't that many people around so we just enjoyed spending time together, meaning sipping some margaritas. All of a sudden the waitress comes up to us, saying two men want to buy us a drink, pointing at a table at the other end of the outdoor section. At this time it was around 10pm, and even though it was midsummer, it started to get dark out, so we really didn't see what the guys looked like at first. So we just thought, yeah, fuck it, why not? And then we went over to thank them, at this time, I recognized that it was a younger looking guy, in his early to mid twenties, and a middle aged man. They were obviously already intoxicated. The younger guy, let's call him Tom, asked us to take a seat, and since he seemed like a nice guy that wanted to chat, we agreed. So as we were talking, getting to know each other a bit, I noticed the older guy intensely staring at me, like he didn't even blink. I looked at him as I noticed him, and it was then when he said, How old are you? You're so beautiful. Do you even know how beautiful you are? I told him I just turned 18, laughed it off, clearly being uncomfortable, and thanked him for the compliment, since I knew he was clearly drunk and tried to change the topic. As we were talking about life in general, Tom tells us that the older guy is actually his neighbor who is currently going through a divorce, and so he wanted to distract him with a night out. We thought it was sweet of him to help this guy going through a hard time. Then he mentions his neighbor as an architect. Then, the conversation turned dark real quick. The guy started to talk about how he doesn't seem to have any sense in life anymore, and that he wanted to end himself. I also struggled a lot with depression since I was a child so I wasn't super freaked out. I was more feeling sad for the guy and tried to calm him down a bit. But then he said, I can't. I just want to end it. I have a knife on me right now. I'm gonna do it right now. Threatening his life, kind of begging us to give him a reason to not do it. Tom at this point just started to apologize and calm him down. That didn't really work. I mean, I felt sad for the guy, but we just met him an hour and a half ago, and you never know what an intoxicated man 
that claims he has nothing to lose, that also carries a knife on him, and is capable of. Me and my best friend, both scared now, come up with a plan over text to fake a call from some male friend of ours who we wanted to meet up with. So she changed my name in her phone quickly to a guy's name, and so I called her while hiding my phone in the pocket of my vest. And let me tell you, this bitch performed the most realistic fake phone call I've ever witnessed. So good, actually, that for a moment I was like, wait, is she really calling me or did she find a friend to call? At that point, the man is just begging us not to go, making us even more uncomfortable. But we just apologized, and as we were about to leave, Tom asked for my number. I wanted to leave so quickly, I just gave him my number but I blocked him right after he texted me. I'm sorry, you really seemed like a sweet dude, but that night was just not it, chief. Me and my best friend still kind of joke about it to this day, how fast it went zero to 100 that night, and how we were definitely not prepared for it. Nothing happened to us that night, but it was very frightening nonetheless. Stay safe, because even though nothing happened to us in particular, you never know what people are capable of. I'm a 26-year-old female living in Scotland. I have a disturbing and downright odd story that I've never considered sharing until now. It involves myself, my cousin, a few friends, and an absolute creep that vanished and got away with everything. My cousin and I are the same age, and we're 14 at the beginning of this near three-year incident. My cousin had gotten a new household computer and had installed and used MSN, as that was the major instant messenger back then. She started adding individuals from everywhere onto her contact list. One boy had stood out. He claimed his name was Mark Halligan, aged 15 from Blackpool, England. They started talking every day, exchanging innocent pictures and becoming very close friends. He quickly admitted he was older, saying he was 17 and apologized for lying. My cousin gave him the benefit of the doubt and continued the friendship. Things got weirder here. He knew it was her birthday soon and wanted to send her a gift. She told me about this and thought it would be cool and wanted to see what he would send. So she agreed, but waited a while before sending her address. He started by sending her phone credit codes, so they could text when the computer was in use. She then gave him the address, and he sent her a lot of stuff. A DVD player, a huge teddy, DVDs, CDs, clothes, sweets, and other various things that she had to explain away to her parents as being a prize from a school competition. This went on for some time, while he still maintained that he was 17, and added on that he made money from an under-21's football placement. Things escalated when he wanted to come up to meet her. She told me she was going to meet him, and she was taking a friend with her to be safe. And she was very excited. While making arrangements, he planned to take the train to Scotland. But of course, the day before he was due to come up, he admitted that he was 21, had a car and a job. She was 15 and thought it was appealing and still went through with it. I phoned her that night and she didn't tell me much, just that she didn't want to talk to him again. She didn't divulge any more information. A few days later, I received a contact request on MSN from Mark. I accepted and he told me how him and his cousin had stopped talking and wanted to know why. I didn't have answers other than she didn't want to speak to him again. We started to become very good friends. He was starting to act the same with me, sending phone credits so I could text him every day. I found him to be a really funny and nice person. I told my cousin that we'd been talking, and she asked me not to speak to him again, but she didn't tell me why. No explanation at all. That night, I told Mark what my cousin had said to me and he asked me to call and sort things out. I agreed, and later that night he called. 
The voice on the other end was very odd, high-pitched and feminine-sounding. We spoke and he'd explain the accident, and it tore his vocal cords as a child. I felt bad and kept talking to him, assuming that was why I was to no longer speak with him, and maybe that's what scared my cousin. Soon after, I got a call from my cousin, who told me that a large package had been sent to her house addressed to me. I went round to her house to get it. We both opened it. It was banned t-shirts, CDs, new converse, books, an iPod, and money. I couldn't believe it. I wasn't sending it back though. At that age, getting all that stuff for free was amazing. I got home and called Mark to thank him for the gifts. He was happy that I was happy, and we kept talking for a few hours. Lo and behold, he asked to come up to visit. I agreed, and I told my best friend. She was very wary and insisted on going with me. The day he was meeting us, we had agreed on a location that was about 20 minutes from my house. We waited outside of a shop for him to arrive, already full of nerves and excitement. He was 10 minutes late, which magnified the feelings. What approached us at a very fast pace and came to an abrupt stop was a blue VW Golf. He sat for five minutes before getting out of the car. We stood and knew something was wrong immediately. What got out of that car was terrifying. Two 15-year-olds expecting someone who we thought was a 21-year-old, handsome, tall, and warm person. Instead, this actually happened. Nothing at all is exaggerated. He stepped out of the car and he stood around five foot tall. He was in all denim. His face, honest to goodness, looked like a burn victim's face. This man was in no way, shape, or form 21. He was easily in his 50s or 60s, and he was truly intimidating. We smiled, said hello, and asked him to go on a walk. We took him towards my house. Whilst walking to the destination, we whispered to each other. We made a plan to run away from him. We exclaimed that we were going to pop to a friend's house to get a DVD to watch at my house. We decided to go to my still best childhood friend of 23 years home, which was en route to my house. Both of us in tears but hiding it, went to our friend's house and nearly collapsed in the doorway. We gave him a brief account of what happened and we told him that we needed to get away from him. We were petrified. He told us to lock the door behind us, and we went into the back of the garden, climbed the fence and ran away like the wind, between the houses and the back gardens, to a heavily wooded area that we knew really well that would lead back to my house. We must have stayed there for a few hours. We knew roughly how long it would take for him to get back to his car and maybe drive around to look for us. So we had to keep away from the roads, and we thought if we stay put, we would be safe. Which we were. During this time, we had calls from Mark coming through, but let them ring out. We made a dash to my house, where we called my cousin to talk to her about it. She got her dad to bring her around, and we talked it out. The now four of us stayed in my house all night, and we didn't leave each other alone for at least the next few days. We both got further messages and phone calls after this meetup, but we ignored them until they stopped. We were too scared to tell anyone, so we decided to keep it a secret. Cut to about six months later, my friend and I were going to Blackpool for a long weekend there with her parents. About two days into the trip, I got a text saying that he saw me in Blackpool and he confirmed this by describing a mint green summer top that I was wearing at the time. He told me that he knew where we were staying. I told him to keep away or I'd phone the police. He apologized and agreed. The next day I was approached by the lady that ran the bed and breakfast. She told me I had an envelope. He had written a note. It basically told me not to call the police and that he would never call me again. It included £500 for my friend and I. Being stupid and not thinking, we took the money, laughing 
already spending it in our heads. We never said a word. We didn't hear anything from him again until about a year later. I received a picture message of a person lying down with his wrists cut, blaming my cousin and I for ruining his life, all because we didn't want to be in contact with him anymore, and neither of us loved him. I contacted her and told her about the message. I went round to her house, and we both decided to tell her dad, and he immediately contacted the police. They asked us to monitor any of their contact and report it for evidence. Within hours of sending that picture, Mark had done something absolutely terrifying. He had called my cousin, and her dad insisted he listen into the conversation. He told her that he had bought her a car and it was outside of her house, and he had left it in the area after dropping it off, and gave her a specific description of it. He told her that there was a key on the wheel, a blue bow on the steering wheel, and all the documents for the car were in the back of the driver's seat. My uncle phoned the police again, told them about the car, and that he had went out to confirm Mark's description of the car. When the police arrived, they arranged for the car to be towed, and to trace the numbers and online profiles that had been used. The only information we got back from the police since that day was that the car was registered to Pamela Halligan, a person he had told us in previous conversation was his sister, which was confusing because he had told us that his sister had died, tragically, during an IRA bombing in 1979, at the age of 10. It was horrible to know that he was watching us when we didn't know. That he was at my cousin's house when we didn't know. He could have been anywhere at any time. Knew anything about us and had the capability to go to extremes with lies and actions. I've researched his name a million times, different spellings and never found anything. We still get chills talking about him and have often not been able to finish a full conversation about him due to the horrible realization of what he had done. This happened in the summer of 2008, I think. I was at a sleepover birthday party at my friend's house. That is going to require some explanation. I live in rural western Pennsylvania. All you need to know about that side of the state is that if you aren't living in Pittsburgh and Erie, you're probably living in an oil town that went bust decades ago. Oh, and you're probably isolated in a forest somewhere too. My family did okay, in spite of the economically depressed area we lived in. Now, my friend had money. His family weren't Wall Street investors or anything, but in a town like mine, it was noticeable. He had a big house, a huge yard, a tree house, a trampoline, big screen TVs everywhere and every video game console ever. You might think I was only friends with this kid because of the stuff he had, but honestly, that isn't true. He's probably in the top five of nicest people I've ever met. His family is also amazing. They took me in for a while when my mom was in hospital once. I still keep in touch with them. So, rich guy, good guy. He had a lot of friends. His birthday parties were pretty legendary among kids in our town. Usually, they involved one of those closed canopy tents outside, with movie projectors inside, along with a soft serve ice cream machine, and slushy machine. The party in 2008, I think he was 14 and I was 13, but it was a little more low-key. There were a few less people than normal, and there weren't any tents or projectors. We played video games for the first part of that night, and then started to play flashlight tag when it got dark. I know that the rules to flashlight tag can vary depending on who's playing. My friends and I used to play it like group hide and seek. The hiders would go hide in the dark, sometimes alone, and sometimes together if it was a great spot. The seekers got the flashlights, and also some pretty cool walkie-talkies. As I said before, the yard we played in was huge, and there were lots of places to hide. The first hour or so was pretty uneventful. We mostly hid around the treehouse, as well as climbing some of the trees inside the yard itself. The only thing we had to worry about was when a cop car drove by. Obviously, we weren't doing anything illegal, 
but we just didn't want to explain why we were sneaking around a house at 11 at night with flashlights. My friend's yard ends in some pretty thick woods. My own house, which is a couple of miles down the road, has some wooded areas around it as well, but not like this. After you leave my friend's backyard, there is about 15 to 20 miles of wilderness before the next town. He does have neighbors on one side, and all of this is going to become relevant in a bit. On this particular time, I was one of the seekers. My group and I were waiting in the house for the other group to hide. We were mostly drinking slushies and messing around. We had just come out of the house and started our search, when we heard a lot of yelling. Suddenly, the entire group came rushing back to the house. They went inside, and my group, really confused at this point, followed them in. It took a few minutes for everyone to calm down and explain what was happening. Their story went like this. That round, they had all decided to hide in the backwoods since we hadn't been back there yet. They had gone a number of places inside, but were still in sight of the house. Looking further inside the woods, they caught sight of a figure at the edge of their vision. It took them a little while to figure out what they were looking at in the dark. They thought it might be a tree or deer or something, but they kept focusing on it. When they were sure that the shape was a human, they started yelling and sprinting back to the house. When everyone was finally inside and mostly settled down, I was freaking out along with some of the other boys. A few of them in my group, including my friend who was throwing the party, were skeptical. They were pretty sure that the other group was just trying to scare us. In fact, my friend was mostly angry about it. He was going to march off into the woods to check it out himself. They stopped and said to him that they should only go back as a group or to wake up his parents who were asleep upstairs. Most of the people who hadn't gone into the woods actually found this to be pretty fun in a weird way. It was like being in a thriller movie. Plus, we were in a low-crime neighborhood, and there were enough of us that one unarmed person shouldn't have bothered us. Even if it was a hoax, it would be a fun scare. We came up with a plan to investigate the woods. The majority of the guys decided to go back into the woods with flashlights and walkie-talkies, they also planned to bring my friend's dog, but that didn't work out. The dog was a golden retriever collie mix, and it was the furthest thing from a guard dog, unless you feared being licked to death. He also got most of his exercise by fetching tennis balls in the big yard, so he was not used to being led on a leash. I waited at the house with another scaredy cat kid, with the other walkie-talkie, ready to wake up my friend's parents or to call the cops. I wasn't taking the situation very well, but I didn't really show it. I tend to seem pretty calm on the outside, when I'm usually a nervous wreck on the inside. I at least attempted to calm the other scaredy cat down. After a few minutes and some excited chatter on the walkie-talkie, the investigators returned in a similar state as the original first group. There was a lot of shouting, and it took a few minutes to get the story straight. This is what happened to them. They had gone to the edge of the woods like the first group originally had done. It took a few minutes of searching, since the figure had been spotted in thicker brush that wasn't easy to reach. One of the kids had swung his flashlight around until he caught sight of something, before yelling and running back to the house. Some of the other boys, who had gotten the same glimpse inside the flashlight beam, behaved similarly. They confirmed that they had seen a person. He was mostly obscured behind a small tree. The features that they could make out from that brief moment were that of a male who was on the taller side, with longish hair. One of the boys who had seen him thought he might be wearing some kind of light flannel. Apparently, he had made no move to approach them, and had just cocked his head out a bit to stare them down from behind the tree. It was at this point that my friend's mom finally came downstairs after all the commotion. We explained the situation to her. Afterwards, she locked all the doors and told us to stay inside, and to tell her if we saw anything else. She explained that the part of the woods that we were going into 
was probably not their land anyway. They just had the closest house to it. Needless to say, I did not sleep well that night. We were situated on air mattresses in my friend's game room. The really frightened kid actually took to sleeping underneath one. Just before sunrise, I finally drifted off for a few hours. When I came to, everyone else was awake and eating pancakes on the patio. My friend's mom was with them. She had checked the woods that morning and had not seen anything amiss. We were a little on edge, but things were pretty normal besides that. When my parents came to pick me up, I was reminded of the fact that I only lived about two miles from my friend's house. Even at home, I struggled to sleep for a while. I just kept thinking how easy it would be for the man in the woods to show up in my yard. Fast forward to a couple of weeks later, and I'm playing video games at my friend's house again. I bring up the subject, but he was very dismissive of it. It was strange, but he was really pretty short with me. It was like he wanted me to drop it. None of his behavior fit his normal personality at all. He did come up with a short explanation, though. Apparently, one of his neighbors had a son a few years older than us. He was tall with long hair. My friend explained that he could be a jerk and was pretty weird. The way he said weird may have indicated some mental condition. My friend's explanation was that this kid had seen us playing and decided to hide in the woods to scare us. That did make me feel a bit better at first. It did seem reasonable on the surface, and there's a good chance that's actually what happened. However, there are a few things that don't sit right with me. In my experience, when someone is trying to scare you, there's a ha-ha, gotcha moment at the end. Like most people want to reveal that the whole thing was good-natured, or they just want to show you how dumb you look over nothing. Back when we had our sleepover in tents, one of my friend's older brothers would rustle the outside of the tent before popping in to see if they had scared us. This person in the woods did nothing like that. He may have just been trying to scare us, and went all in on the whole thing, wherein his only pleasure was knowing that he had scared us for life. Or, if this kid really did have problems... Maybe he just didn't understand how pranks typically went. His explanation also brought back an old memory of mine. I had been going to my friend's house for close to ten years at that point. In one of these early years, I remember playing a game with my friend and one of his neighbors who lived across the street. Both my friend and the neighbor had crabapple trees in their yards. We played a game of basically dodgeball with moldy apples thrown across the road. The game ended when the neighbor, who was a few years older, chucked a crab apple at my friend's head as hard as he could. It absolutely nailed my friend, and he was on the ground crying. I brought him inside where his parents asked me what was wrong. I told them about the game and the neighbor kid. When he had finished crying, his parents scolded him and said that they had warned him about this. They just said that the neighbor kid was not nice. For the record, he did not have long hair, but this was a number of years prior to the incident. Now, I don't know if this was the same neighbor that my friend had pinned the blame on, which brings me to some other disturbing things. My friend never gave me the suspect's name, even when I pressed him on it. What's more unsettling was that my friend was not among the kids who had actually seen the guy directly. This was just his explanation for what happened. I don't think my friend was actually trying to cover anything. I think he was just worried that I wouldn't come to his house anymore if I didn't feel safe. That was the last time I had a sleepover at my friend's house. That wasn't really because of the incident, but because we were entering high school and overnight parties started meaning something else entirely. My friend's explanation does seem plausible, and that makes a pretty creepy story on its own. The alternatives are even more frightening. I don't even want to think about what kind of guys go stalking teenagers in the woods in the middle of the night.